Well, let's jump into it. So for those who haven't been on one of these before, we'll just, I'll be going through a bunch of content um, and then we'll be some question and answers at the end. If sure. um, there's any specific questions, I'll just bring up the, the group chat or you can stick your hand up, but there'll be time at the end to uh, go through stuff. Uh, but I'll just put the group chat up for anything that pops up with that. Um, We're allowed to drink. You can do what you like. So Okay. All right. <laughs> Got the vino, so... I want, yeah, be a bit of a worry okay. if I was drinking at uh, 10 a.m., but yeah, you can go for it. What time is it there? Are you sort of seven, seven, seven eight. The evening. perfect time for wine. Yes, um, yes. okay. So, to today's um topic, as you know, is looking at uh horror films. So, um, which I'm really excited about uh running this because horror is one of the main areas I write in, and it's pretty much what got me into making films from a really young age. So, um, and horror is a hugely popular and successful genre. So some of these other webinars I've done, I've talked about genres going in and out of fashion, but horror is like crime and love stories and action films have just been all the way through uh, history of cinema. And they cross over all cultures. So if you go and have a look on streaming services and you'll see that there's horror films offered from Serbia, Indonesia, Australia, Africa, um, all through Southeast Asia, huge horror industries there. Um, and it's, there's all of these other production companies that are making horror films that don't make it to the cinema, but they're just going direct to online streaming services because they know it's such a big area. Um, so the main question is, is, what is horror? You know, what is a horror film? And horror is really about fear and dread. So fear is something that might happen and dread is knowing that something is going to happen but we can't stop it. So the horror genre really exploits these two extreme human emotions and what they do is they dramatise the fear of a chaotic and dangerous world that surrounds us so that's the fear part. So we're surrounded by danger, so something might happen. And they also dramatise dread, which is the reality that we are all going to die. And so what a horror film does is it allows the audience to delve into these deep fears that we have of this dread and chaos we're surrounded by on both a conscious and subconscious level. And what it means is we can safely experience this chaos. Um, so we know that there's a chaos, it's dangerous, the world is uncontrollable. But when we watch this film, we can experience this and it's sort of a catharsis um, because we can experience it um, and we've lived, you know, to fight another day. So we get through that moment. Or even Stephen King makes a really interesting point. We talk about this idea that the reality is that we're all going to die. That the horror experience is um, essentially a rehearsal for what could, you know, what will be our death. We just hope it's going to be in a peaceful way, but we're terrified it might not be. So that's what draws audiences in to that, um, that experience. So... And so horror writers, as I said, they really tap into these ideas. And so we're going to cover some of those ideas in this webinar, how they're created and the different ways that plays out in stories. And with the horror genre, it's, it's a super genre. So there's lots of sub genres in it, like we get with the, the crime, which we did in the webinar a few weeks ago, um, that we need to define what those sub genres are because it's too broad a term to work in. Um, and by defining those subgenres, it'll really help you focus your creativity and help you construct a story to deliver what the audience is looking for specifically. The most important thing to remember with horror films is the audience is very passionate and very dedicated. Um, so they're experts in the horror genre and they're well ahead of you. They've watched everything. So you need to kind of know what that specific subgenre you're working in is um, and understand that so you can be working on the level that they're going to be expecting. 
Okay, so first we'll go through and define what the subgenres of horror are. So the first one we have is monster. So this is things like going back originally, it was stuff like Godzilla and Dracula, uh, Frankenstein's monster. So then we have um, zombie films. And it might be undefined monster. So if anyone's seen a film called, has anyone seen The Descent? Really great little horror film mm. with a group. I think it's six ladies go caving in there and they find monsters down in these caves. It uh, plays around with a whole lot of, it's a great little film, but it plays around with ideas of the dark and claustrophobia. Um, but down there, there's these monsters they discover in the caves. Uh, so the second subgenre is killer. And a specific type. So this is when we go that the killer is a human as such that is functioning in society. So if we look at, you know, you got uh, Norman Bates in Psycho. Um, Hush, which is a great little horror film. Um, Saw, Hostel, Deep Red, which is a great horror, uh, Italian horror film. And You're Next. Now, another type of killer, but we put it in a different sub-genre, sub is the slasher. So even though they might be human, they're not sort of the, say, the same as Norman Bates in Psycho when we go, this is a normal person we're interacting with who can kill us. This is a person that um, is walking around with that sole purpose of killing people. And they often look, uh, they don't look like an everyday person. So they have things like uh, Friday the 13th, Halloween, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. What a great title that is for a horror film. What a, like such a notorious title and film. And uh, Scream is another example. So slashes were huge in the, in the 80s, drifted for a while. And then in the mid to late 90s, Scream came along and reinvigorated. And it's sort of gone out a little bit, but it will come back in again. Um, The next subgenre is supernatural. And this actually breaks down into a couple. So with your supernatural, you have ghost horrors, which is one of my favorite. That's the film I'm directing at the moment is a, a ghost horror. Um, and classics in that are from Japan. So Ring or Ringu, which was, had an American remake, which is really good, but I think watching the original is worthwhile. Um, Juwon, which is called or The Grudge. Uh, we have Amityville Horror. It's a classic 70s ghost horror. Uh, and The Orphanage. Has anyone seen The Orphanage, a Spanish film? Good to hear, Patrick. It's a beautiful and frightening little film. It's really worth watching The Orphanage. So, um, yeah, we've, got, we've actually got that DVD. We thought it was worth owning because it's, it was good and scary. Absolutely. And it is a little bit harder to find online. In fact, if anyone wants it, I can send you an online link to it. But it's... Uh, but it's got a very good drama, human base to it. And it's, it's not, uh, it's not a very traditional one, but it's a beautifully written screenplay. Uh, then the other second supernatural genre we get is possession. So things like The Omen and The Exorcist. And the third is um, supernatural powers. So we have things like carry, uh, scanners, which is a great one with those head when they, the people can just think about you and blow your head up. <laughs> Such great films from the eighties about that. Uh, and Firestarter. Then the next subgenre we have is witches and the occult. So we have uh, Blair Witch Project, Suspiria, which is another great Italian horror film, which was remade, I think, a year and a half ago, but I haven't bothered watching watching that. Um, I'll stick to the classic. And Rosemary's Baby. <coughs> And the next subgenre from that is comedy horror. So um, 
some re- there's been a lot of great ones over the years. There's uh, one that was really popular was Shaun of the Dead, the English film. Uh, there's Evil Dead. Uh, Black Sheep, which is a really fun little comedy horror from, uh, from New Zealand that was made about a decade ago. Uh, one from Italy called Della Morte Della More, which translates to, it's roughly uh, the Grave Digger Man or the Graveyard Man. I can send a link around for that one, actually, um, which is a really funny sort of zombie film. And one that came out about two years ago, if anyone's seen it, is One Cut of the Dead from Japan. It's a really interesting, uh, so it's a comedy horror, but a really interesting concept. I won't spoil it. Uh, But if you go and check that one out, they do. It's really a story of two halves. I just saw that. It's it's a riot. What did you think? Did you enjoy it, Neil? Oh, yeah. And, and, And my friend set it up. He didn't say it was a comedy. He just said, you know, mm. it's in three parts. The first part's one, sh- one continuous take. And then, so, you know, yeah. I mean, I watched the first part as, as if it was real, you know, a real movie. Yeah, it's really interesting, slightly experimental. Um, really funny and good stuff. It's worth, uh, yeah, I only watched it a, a couple of months ago and I was really impressed with that. Um, and another one is The Host from Korea, which I think is late, late 90s, might be early 2000s. Um, then the next subgenre which you get referred to is um, schlock. Uh, so schlock horrors are really over the top horror films, and they're mostly silly, but they're really fun at the same time. And horror audiences love these. Uh, Trauma so Studios. What, sorry. Trauma Studios. Tra- exactly. It's just get, that yeah. was. What, the one I had on my list, to- the Toxic Avenger, and yeah. it's made by in um, Trauma, a Traumaville is they're always great for that. Toxic Avengers, um, Brain Dead, which is also called um, I think it was called Dead Alive in the American release. It was Peter Jackson's third feature film, so really over the top zombie film with so much blood and gore. It has this hilarious scene when he's walking through a zombie horde with a lawnmower turned on and just cutting them all up. So again, really over the top and fun. Um, And another one is Pieces, which is a really nasty little schlocky, uh, it was a Spanish-American production from the 80s. Uh, These films always end up having really big cult following. So you meet anyone who's into horror and they've seen or they know about these films. And then the other subgenre is uh, Splatter. So this is lots of blood and guts and extreme visuals. Um, Technically, it's not a genre in and of itself. It's really, you know, a technique or an effect that they're after. And it's combined with other subgenres. So we get things like Maniac and Tenebrae, which are combining uh, killer storylines and using splatter. So something like even though it's very brutal psycho, there wasn't a huge amount of blood we're seeing in that. A lot of it's suggested. Whereas when we do the killer in Maniac or Tenebrae, we're showing all sorts of gratuitous violence. Um, and Dawn of the Dead, as, as the, the second George Romero film, not the remake, was, wasn't was the first zombie film, obviously, but it was one of the ones that really used this, this splatter, over-the-top violence, lots of heads exploding, limbs getting ripped off, people getting eaten your entrails being pulled out, all that fun kind of stuff. You can see you like that one, Cheryl. You can. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then we have films that combine the multiple horror genres. So sometimes it won't be just a specific genre, but it'll take sort of two of them and combine them. And that would be uh, Nightmare on Elm Street actually takes the supernatural ghost horror and combines it with a slasher genre. Has everyone seen uh, the original Nightmare on Elm Street? Yeah. Great film. Such a great film. Um, Evil Dead combines three of them. So we have, it's using, it's the comedy horror, but it's also a possession story. 
and slasher. So slash is that classic thing when you've got a group of kids and they're all getting kind of knocked off, or teenagers getting knocked off one or the other in various ways. Um, Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer combined horror and crime story. And Suspiria, which I mentioned earlier, is it's a witcher story, uh, but it's also using splatter in the genre as well. Some really memorable deaths in that film. <clears throat> And really illogical. That's a really interesting one. It's, has anyone, who's seen Suspiria, the original one? Anybody? I've seen it, Patrick. Yep. So that one is, it's a, essentially a twisted fairy tale, uh, a horror fairy tale. And a lot of it doesn't make sense logically, but the horror effect is amazing. Okay, so that's what the horror uh, subgenres are. What we're just going to do is define what's not horror because it's really important to understand those differences when you're working in them and there's a couple of confusions. So found footage is, it's a filming technique. So lots of people think it's a horror technique probably because Blair Witch started it and there's been quite a few successful um, found footage horrors, but there's been comedies and thrillers and other genres made on that. So automatically saying found footage is not a horror film. Um, thrillers that have horror elements but they're not actually horror films. This is films like Silence of the Lambs and Seven. So they're very much thriller stories and they just use some of the horror aesthetic and ideas and it particularly comes across in production technique rather than what the story is. So what separates these is these stories are more exhilarating. The audience is scared, but they're watching going, oh, I wanna find out what happens next with this mystery. Like they want the mystery unraveled in seven so they desperately want to know what's going on and they're intrigued whereas the horror audience is terrified about finding out what's happening um, and the difference also is thrillers are much more complex stories so they'll have lots of twists and turns and the characters will be more complex so horror stories will be more straightforward uh, and the characters will be more straightforward so we're not sitting there like when you watch Sansa Lambs going, oh, I'm trying to unravel this puzzle. We're sort of going, what's the nature of the monster? But we're not going, oh, what's this twist and turn? And what's this clue that unlocks all of that? They're not interested in watching this or a horror film being gripped and terrified. So it's a totally different experience. <clears throat> um, Gothic fantasy. So these are things like cemeteries at night, haunted houses with cobwebs hanging off them, full moons, CGI ghost horrors. Um, so some of them, these used to be horror ideas when we're going back to the old hammer horror, you know, all the really early horror films. But now audiences are too sophisticated. So straight away when we see these places, we know that we're sort of um, in something pretending to be a horror film. Um, but it's actually not, not horror. Uh, we're very much more playing in that gothic fantasy style. Um, so something like recently I watched a little bit of a TV series, Haunting of Hill House, and straight away it just looks like it's a gothic horror house and it has these CGI ghosts, and straight away we just, you're not in that horror setting. Um, and we'll find that when we do use those gothic ideas, they get they get modernised, which I'll look at a little bit later. So be, for example, if you do a classic Dracula story now, the old one, we kind of look and they go, oh, that's, that's sort of nice and quaint. It's up in a, in a castle and he sleeps in a coffin, whereas the modernised version is we have to stick it in in the modern world. So these vampires, we see that they don't look like vampires at the start. <laughs> uh, so parody comedies and not horrors. So things like Love at First Bite, Cabin in the Woods, um, Scary Movie, which is a full parody. Um, so the sole purpose of these films is to make you laugh by, by sort of playing around with the familiar horror tropes and settings and then subverting or making fun of that. And that's where they're different from the horror comedies, which you go, they're very much horror stories that are going to have comedy laced throughout them, but they're not actually mocking or parodying what the horror tropes are. 
<clears throat> and also things these parody comedies will always usually have ratings that are that are PG. So they're very much family friendly or made for um, for younger audiences. When you get uh, actual true horror comedies, they're not made for for children. They're very much made for adults because they're going to combine all those elements. So Ghostbusters would be another example of that. It's not really a horror film. When you're five or six years old, it's kind of really scary. But a general audience sitting down watching that are not going to be scared, and that's not the purpose of it. <clears throat> okay, so that's... The next thing is the horror protagonist. So when you're developing your horror stories, is the protagonist. So for those who haven't done any of my courses or been on these webinars before, just know that the protagonist is the main character in the story. Um, so a couple of really important things to do with them is we need to empathize with the protagonist. So we, we want that in any story, but the reason in horror films, sometimes the protagonist is just, just kind of put in there for the horror stuff to happen. What we want to do is we want to empathize with them because what that does is it increases the fear and horror in the audience for two reasons. Firstly, they care about this person now, so they don't want horrible things to happen. And secondly, when we empathize and care, we suddenly are in their shoes. So we're now being manipulated to kind of go, oh, I care about them. So what's happening to them could be happening to me. So that's a really powerful technique <clears throat> is to find a way that your audience empathizes with the protagonist. The other really crucial part when you're writing them, and that's what separates horrors from thrillers is that the protagonist is not a hero. Their sole job is to try and survive. All they're doing in the story is their best to survive. And this is said the component that separates, you know, the difference between if you're writing a horror versus a thriller. The thrill, thriller still, could, they could be terrified. We're going into scary situations, but their goal is very different. They're actively searching after something. So in Science of the Lambs, it's about her to bring about justice, find the killer and save the girl. So she's going after that. Whereas in a horror film, it's like this event happens and it's like, how do I survive and how do I stop this moment? Um, <clears throat> and as I said before, that the your horror characters are usually quite straightforward. So they're not really complex characters, but it doesn't mean that they're really stupid either. Having said that, they're going to make stupid choices in the story. Um, and this is the classic horror thing, how we build tension, because the audience is sitting there watching in horror and they're like, no, don't go there. Don't do that. You know, don't go down the stairs. Don't go swimming. You know, we see them like, there's that joke. It's like, oh, we're out in the forest by ourselves and there's, there's a lake. We're going to strip off in the full moon and go for a swim. And straight away, we're like, no, don't do that. So the reason we kind of get them to do these things that are not always the smartest um, is to get the audience to do that. And I remember years ago, I was in a, a film called um, The Caretakers, it was a little ghost horror, and I was watching it in the cinema, and a woman early on says to, to one of the caretakers at this hotel, it's like, whatever you do, just don't go down into the basement. And then three quarters of the way through the film, when stuff's really amping up, she heads to the basement. And as she's walking, there's someone in the audience is like, no, stop. <laughs> it was such a great reaction. And then everyone else you could see, all the girlfriends were cowering into the boyfriend or husband's, you know, armpits and shoulders trying to hide. And we did, we're just like, the one thing you shouldn't do. And of course she finds trouble when she goes there. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> now, even though they're going to be making some of these decisions that don't seem the smartest, what's really important when your horror protagonist is that they have an awareness that something is wrong compared to the other characters around them. And this is what will separate them from the other characters and will empathize more with them. So in Alien, which is a horror film, not a sci-fi, so it's a sci-fi setting, but it's very much a horror story. Um, when Kane and then they come back and he's got the uh, face hugger attached to him and Ripley's the one who's like, do not let him back in, we need to quarantine him. She gets overridden by other people on the crew for different reasons, but that's the awareness that she has. She's like, there could be a danger in this moment. 
Uh, in Halloween, so for those who've seen it, um, Jamie Lee Curtis's character is more aware that there's something she knows someone's following her, or there's something going on. There's all those early scenes. It's a slow burn in the first act in particular, but she'll turn around and she'll like, did I see something? Was there a guy behind the bushes? And she has this sort of awareness where her friends are totally oblivious to what's going on. They're not sort of suspecting anything is dangerous at this stage. <clears throat> um, Jaws is another great horror film. Um, he knows that there's a shark and that the beaches should be closed. So if you compare that, like straight away, he's like, no, something's up. We need to check this out. Let's close the beaches down, though he gets stopped by others. Um, in The Exorcist, even though they're going through all of these different medical procedures, um, Ellen Bernstein, so her mum, Linda Blair's mum in the film is, she knows there's something really wrong with her daughter. She doesn't know exactly what it is and she's trying all these different things, but deep down she's got this dread or horror building that something really wrong is going on with her daughter. <clears throat> Another important part when you're building your horror protagonist, and I love this part in horror films, which is how are they responsible for their situation? And this is a really good horror technique that we're playing when we talk about these, these fears we have conscious and subconscious, because it's kind of like, oh no, I can do something that brings about my downfall, that can bring on my death or in these horror situations. So in, um, in The Ring, it's, um, she watches the video. So she hears about this haunted videotape and she tracks it down and watches it. So she actually says at one point in the film, I know particularly she does in the Japanese version. I can't remember in the American version, but at one point she's like, oh, if I just hadn't watched that video. <laughs> so in a way that it was her inquisitive nature um, or curiosity killed the cat. So she'd be fine if she didn't track it down. Um, in Psycho, if um, she didn't steal the money and flee, then she wouldn't have ended up driving and stopping at Bates Motel. So she'd still be alive. So that thing about stealing the money and fleeing, she created the situation. Uh, Pet Cemetery, which the film was good, but the book is really creepy. I just read that a few months ago again. And it was, um, it's the idea that the, if he didn't just, he's so distraught. For those who haven't seen the story, his son dies and then he takes it and buries him in the cemetery that they will come back to life, which brings in this horrible situation. So again, if he didn't do that, he wouldn't have been in the situation he was in. Um, Jaws is a really interesting one. Um, the way they play on this is, because as I said at the start, he says, oh, there is something really wrong. We need to do something about it. So he doesn't necessarily have that responsibility bit, but there's a really tragic scene after the, the second victim, so the young boy's eaten um, in front of everybody. And then the mother, a couple of scenes later, comes up to him and slaps him across the face uh, when they're on the pier and, and sort of says, you know, my boy would be alive, essentially. You could have stopped that. And he, rather than him saying, I tried to, but they didn't, you know, the townsfolk and the mayor, they wouldn't let me. They said, we need to stay open. He just wears that responsibility. And somewhere deep down, he's like, yeah, if I had have done something more, that kid would be still alive. So that's his kind of responsibility for the situation. And he now has to, to rectify that. Um, has anyone seen Eden Lake, a, um, a British horror film? It's really cool. So it's a couple go to next to this lake to camp for the weekend and just as they turn up and then they're sitting on the next to the lake and there's these rowdy teenager kids with music and and being boorish over to the side of the lake ruining their tranquility and the guy just gets up and goes over and asks them could they turn their music down and it is the worst decision he could ever make in his life so um it's a really effective cool little horror film worth checking out um, <clears throat> The Exorcist is sort of more a subtle way. It's, it's not heavily delved into, but it's, it's sort of... The, um, Regan is playing around with a Ouija board early in the film. So we, we never get a full explanation, which you don't need, but we get this sense of, has she been playing around in the occult? Was it if she didn't play with this Ouija board, um, maybe the situation wouldn't have happened to her. Um, has anyone seen The Others with Nicole Kidman? Yes. Yeah. 
great, great film. I'm not going to spoil. I would highly recommend watching it. I won't spoil it, but Nicole Kidman has completely created the entire situation that's haunting it. It's totally on her. Um, I won't go into it, spoil it though. It, which has just had uh, the Stephen King two, or they had the telly movie and then the sort of two-part film, is all of the horror happens. It's a manifestation of each child's fear. So they essentially bring that horror into the world. Uh, Blair Witch Project is they go looking for the witch and unfortunately they find it. And Nightmare on Elm Street, which we've talked a little bit about, is they do it slightly differently. The kids in the film or the teenagers are not responsible, but it's their parents that were responsible. So they're suffering for the sins of their parents, <clears throat> which is even a little bit more kind of devilish and cruel because it's like, we didn't do anything, but we're going to suffer for it. Um, and as the, the parents are going to suffer as well. Um, if it's not sins of the parents, another one, and this is particularly used in ghost horror, but also we see a little bit in slasher, which is sins of the past. So something like ghost story, where they're involved in killing someone that comes back to haunt them. The woman the in fog. black. Sorry? The fog. The fog. Yeah, all these ones. So again, there's this bit of the past that's coming back to haunt. Now we see these, these really interesting, um, the, you know, there's these zombie films that like zombie confederates or these different groups that come back from the past to haunt, so, um, <clears throat> which are always really fun. And, or something happened at that location. So it's not necessarily sins of the past, but something just happened at that location. Um, so Juwon, which is the grudge Japanese film, which also had that really good re American remake. It's really, bleak in its context it's just like when something violent happens at a location or something horrible that person is just going to keep haunting it forever it, that's it that's the horror going no fixing it no solving it and that's the setup of this horrendous event that happens at a house um, <clears throat> the shining is another one that does that so they go up to the outlook cafe that has all of its history and everything going on and the other version, the, the final part of where they're responsible is they enter the location that is the monster's domain. So we talked about the descent where they go down into the caves. Uh, Highline, which is this really cool little horror slasher film set up in the mountains in Eastern Europe is really cool. Um, Deliverance, which is actually a horror film, is the same, the same concept. So they go into that area. If you just didn't go there, you'd still be alive. Now, there's always exceptions to these uh, principles in any genre. And the exception is um, they may, may not be complicit. So the horror is thrust upon them and it's how they deal with it. So zombie films are the classic one. Um, the horror film might be the character is losing their mind. So it's not their fault. This is the idea of the chaos within us, which is a horrific idea that your mind can go on you. Um, so The Tenant, the Roman Polanski film, is a look at his um, losing his mind. Um, Rosemary's Baby, they just moved into the wrong apartment. <laughs> Any other apartment block and they'd be fine. Um, Suspiria, so she just, she joins a dance academy. It just happens to be run by witches. And A Quiet Place, which came out about 18 months ago, if anybody saw that, really terrific little horror film, very effective use of sound or lack of sound. Um, and that's, you know, it's, it's an alien invasion. Okay, so here's the really fun part where it comes in, and this is the horror antagonist. So this is the baddie or the monster. So it's all about the monster in the horror film. So they're the memorable ones. So franchises aren't built around the protagonist. They're built around the antagonist. So they're here to stay. Um, so if we have a look at the example, we've been talking about Nightmare on Elm Street. It's who's the antagonist in Nightmare on Elm Street? 
Freddy Krueger. Freddy Krueger, I remember. Who's the protagonist in the story? <laughs> no one knows. Nancy's her name. Now, what's really interesting is that Nancy's actually been in three of the Nightmare on Elm Street films, which is quite quite a lot. You don't often get a re recurring character through horror. Um, Freddie's been in eight of the films, a TV series, plus he was in Freddy vs. Jason. So, and he's the memorable one that we got all the way through. Um, so if we go, do you know who the, who's the antagonist in Friday the 13th? Jason, sorry? Is that Jason? Jason, yep. Who's oh, the the mother, though, did it not? And, correct. It's Jason's yeah. mother in the first one, and then in the others yeah. it becomes Jason. Um, who's the antagonist? Who's the protagonist in the first Friday the 13th? I, I couldn't tell you. I can't even remember their names. So, <laughs> apart from Jamie Lee Curtis in Halloween, so we all know Michael Myers is the antagonist in Halloween, and Jamie Lee Curtis because she became so famous, but I can't remember, you know, we don't remember a character or friend's names. Um, so if we have a look at other classic characters, you know, through history, this is when we had, you know, it was Dracula. How many films have been made on Dracula? Jaws as a shark, you know, there was four films made on Jaws and so many rip-offs, it's not funny. Um, Jigsaw from the Saw franchise. Um, they're all very different. You know, horror films have all different antagonists and types of monsters, but they all have one thing in common, and this is absolutely crucial to your horror protagonist, is they must do evil things and enjoy it. The difference is they've got to enjoy it. You can have characters doing evil things, they don't enjoy it. Your horror antagonist has to enjoy what they're doing. Um, and they even do this when you think of monster films. There's something about the alien that seems to enjoy killing the people. There's something about Jaws that seems to be enjoying this killing and destruction. Um, <clears throat> so they've got to really get off on what they're doing. Uh, so as you're developing your protagonist or your antagonist or your monster, um, the few things you really want to be thinking about, and that is what do they look like physically? And this is a really big part when we look at them. They're all, the, the classic ones are very memorable looking. So Freddy Krueger, we know we've got these fingernails, knives. He's burnt and grotesque. And he's, you know, this sort of red, orange, green, weird colored um, sweater that he's wearing. Um, <clears throat> leather face from Texas Chainsaw Massacre's classic. So it's not only just his chainsaw, it's the fact that he's got this leather face made of other people's skin. Um, so they've very carefully thought about what their monster is going to look like and how that's going to terrify us. So not only how they look physically, we also want to think about the backstory. You know, is there a reason for why they're acting the way they are? Um, so Sadako in the ring is a really good example. So we find out that she had, had these uh, telepathic powers and that her father was this this sort of mad scientist, psychologist type character um, and how she ended up and why she ended up dead in the well, which sets up the haunting. Um, obviously, you're not really going to have a backstory for most monster stories, but some will. So if we look at Godzilla, it was the idea of it was the, um, you know, nuclear bomb getting dropped. So we had a lot of horror films post nuclear concepts, um, but it's not crucial to it. Uh, if it's a more person type character, so especially we get into our killer type characters, is, you know, what's their philosophy? So with Norman Bates, we not only know his, his backstory is crucial, but his, you know, philosophy is kind of like, we all get a little crazy sometimes. That's how he sort of explains it. Um, <clears throat> now, if it's a, a monster, the key bit you want to do with their with that is not only how they look, but how does it function? So Alien is that example. We kind of go, it doesn't have, we don't need to know its backstory and all of this kind of stuff. It's a monster, but we know it has this incredible thing where it attaches to your face, it impregnates you, it bursts out, 
acid for blood, all of these great horrific ideas that we get from the idea that it'll just plant its baby and you want to spawn out is horrifying as a concept. Um, and this acid for blood is just a genius, genius idea because it becomes a lot harder to kill. You can't just, you know, blow it up, shoot it or whatever because there's going to be repercussions. Um, make it huge is one of the other things when, with the monster. So if it doesn't have a brilliant design to it, make it huge. So Jaws is just a massive shark. And we see this with any of these, uh, something like uh, any of the, you know, the crocodile films and all of those sorts of ones. We often see they're huge crocodiles, huge alligators. Um, <clears throat> well, what you do is you combine two elements together that shouldn't be together. So, for example, zombies, we have the living and the dead together. Or you might have half man, half animal. So the fly, which was a great, I think it was early 1950s. And then there was the remake in the 80s, um, <clears throat> which is a great combination of those two. And the final one with that is it's a monster that we just don't know or comprehend what that is. So it's otherworldly that we see and the descent works on that. Well, the monsters come down, you know, got these alien concepts like an invasion of the body snatchers uh, and all those sorts of things. Um, <clears throat> and the final part with the antagonist is the rules of the antagonist's world. And this is a really important one. So, for example, with Freddy in Nightmare on Elm Street, the rule is he can, when he kills you in your dream, you die in real life. So you don't want suddenly that he kills someone in the dream and then they don't die. So you want to keep these things consistent. So with zombie films, so George Romero pretty much built the entire mythology and rules with Night of the Living Dead, um, which is that once you die, you come back to life. And the only way to be killed is either destroying the brain or burning them. So you can't kill them otherwise. You know, you can shoot them in the arm, leg or whatever, how you'd incapacitate a human. It doesn't matter. You can cut them in half. They're still going to be alive. So you've got to destroy the brain. Um, in Ring, the rule is, is you watch the haunted video, you get a phone call and you'll die seven, day late, seven days later. So the question is, is how do you stop that inevitable, that idea about the dread, it's going to happen. Um, and these things go back even into early mythology. It really started with the early things like vampires, you know, where, so vampires can't come out at night. Werewolves appear on full moons, all these ideas. So we don't use those concepts as much anymore, but we see how that's always been inbuilt. There's some rules around the, um, the monster and how they function. <clears throat> And grudge, which I mentioned, which is as simple as something violent happens at a location, it's going to remain there for eternity and haunt that location and whoever's there, which is probably out of all of them the most full on of the rules because you just you can't do anything about it. <clears throat> okay, the last point I want to cover before we get into questions, which is how you create the horror effect. So once you know your genre, your protagonist, your antagonist, and that um, And the best way to go about this is to start with the real world and then introduce the horror into it. So this comes back to this idea that gothic and fantasies and scary locations are not really horror films. Um, because once you've got that horror setting, the audience straight away can put their defences up and dismiss what's going on. It's like, oh, I'm just getting on a fairground ghost train. <laughs> It's going to be a few little jumps, little scares, and I'm going to get to the end and it's going to be over. Um, so automatically they're like, I'm defensive or I'm not taking this as seriously. If you go with realism and naturalism, it creates an authenticity and this lulls the audience into suspending their disbelief. Because they can't go, oh, well, I just won't go into what looks like Dracula's castle. It's like... This is set in a normal suburban house. I know this setting now. I'm scared because it means the horror can jump out from anywhere. Uh, so the exorcist 
does this really well. At the start, we have this nine to 10 minute sequence, which is about an archeological dig uh, in Iraq. And it, um, there's horror ideas. The, the demon is sort of introduced within that, but very much, it does not feel like a horror film. Um, and then our second part of that setup is we go to a very normal apartment that um, Regan and her mother are in. So we jump into what's a very normal setting apartment that this horrendous possession is going to take place. Um, Alien is really famous for doing this because they go, it's a science fiction setting. How do we not straight away go, we're just watching a science fiction film. So what Aliens does, and if you watch this really closely, is it's actually about truckers in space. So not only the way they've designed the ship, but the characters, there's that great scene when they wake up from their... Um, from their hypersleep and they're sitting around eating a meal. And the whole thing is they're talking about bonuses and the company and the union. And it's the kind of thing that truckers, when they all get together at, you know, whatever petrol station or convenience store, and that's what they all sort of stand around and talk about. So, and it's very naturalistic the way the film plays out at the start. There's lots of improv and they're just sitting around. It doesn't feel like, you know, uh, Buck Rogers or something like that up in space. Um, <clears throat> And also there's lots of, this is a really good little bit. There's lots of nesting in the film. So you see all of the areas they're inhabiting. They've nested as humans would at their workspace. And they said, when you see truckers out on the truck, they've got different stuff on the dashboard or hanging off there. And if you have a look at aliens, all of those characters have these little bits of nesting going on. Um, so that's how we kind of go, no, this is, feels like real people we can empathize with. Um, the ring is great for this. It's just a suburban house at the start of the film. So in, in fact, the entire setting is very suburban, which is very disconcerting about it. Now, having said that, you want this real world, but early on you want to introduce the horror concepts into it because you still want to be getting the audience uneasy from the start. Um, so Alien does this by having this weird stuff if you've seen Alien right at the start while they're in hypersleep and the camera is tracking through the spaceship and first of all we've got this camera moving which shouldn't be moving so straight away like oh that's a bit strange and then there's paper blowing in the breeze and there shouldn't be any breeze of any sort in there um and so we just get this weird kind of off feeling about what's what's this other presence in there um the exorcist like i said with the archaeological dig we get this concept of good versus evil is introduced through the, some of the different artifacts that um father Merrin has dug up and we're seeing just some of these sort of horror ideas or imagery built in and the ring in the opening scene is the girls are sitting around in their room talking about this haunted tape but they're also talking about how their friends went off to this cabin in the woods and it was boys and girls and you know there was sex and all these things going on which are just building all these horror concepts within to it and an urban myth that's happening um, which climaxes in a death actually happening in that scene. Um, Saw, which I mentioned before, so it's a very natural setting, um, but it's straight into the horror. So the character wakes up because they've been drugged and they're just on the floor of this weird kind of public toilet, uh, but there's a dead body next to them on the ground. So natural setting and horror idea, bang, straight away. Um, the descent, which I talked about, is they're, they're just going on a caving trip. But quickly when we're down in that world, because we're getting into dark and horror, and this is very, very um, going back to caveman sort of times. Like once we're in the dark, we can't see the danger that's coming. Night of the Living Dead is a really interesting opening because... Are we back? Sorry, that just dropped out. Are you all there? Can you hear me clearly or not? We lost you there for a minute. Okay, we're all back in. That was interesting. That's coming through clearly now. You can hear me again? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Night of the Living Dead goes against this idea a little bit because it opens set in a cemetery, but it's during the day. So it subverts our expectation because the monster that's going to be introduced isn't the classic old monster of Dracula or something. It's introducing the dead coming back to life that eat you. 
So that part went very quickly into this horror concept, but it's just a different one that we were used to at the time. Um, <clears throat> And then the next step on how you build the horror effect is how you introduce your antagonist into the story. So there's two ways to go about this. So first way is that you don't show much of your antagonist. You just do it little bit by bit. Oh, there we are. We, we lost you at introducing yeah. your antagonist. Yeah, I just saw that. It's got a little bit sketchy suddenly. Let's have a look. Okay. It's the first time we've had that drop out in uh, one of these mm -hmm. webinars. So, where was it? Yeah, the introducing little bit by bit. So, um, <clears throat> so as the movie progresses, you're going to see more and more of them along the way. So, you give them a little bit of taste of it and then you move on with the story and what this is doing is a technique called theater of the mind so when we see a little bit our survival mechanism is to make up really bad stuff so it's the idea of whatever you can make up in your mind will be worse than what someone can show and alien does this really well we don't see much of the alien at all for big chunks of the film but you see a little grab and then we think oh my god it's a lot worse than it could ever be right we lost you then david again Oh, which bit did you lose me in? Hang on, I'm just going to test After this. theatre of the mind. Okay. Uh, I'm just seeing what's going on with these settings here. Okay, is that coming through clear now? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the theatre of the mind is said as you're just showing little grabs and then the audience will build up the horror much worse in their mind, which is what they do with uh, Alien does that. Jaws is another good example. We don't see much of the shark, particularly early on. We just see there's little bits and pieces. We see the effect it is having. Um, and at that point, when we get a really good glimpse of it is when there's that classic line of, you know, we're going to need a bigger boat. But it's too late because they're out there and they're committed. Um, and this again goes back to very much caveman sort of times of where, how we create stuff. You think about when you're in bed at night and you hear a bump or some noise, suddenly you kind of go, oh my God, it could be this, 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 and this. The minute you find out what that source is, the horror diminishes. Um, now, the other way, if you're not going to show the bit by bit approach, is to show them big and horrific straight up front. So this will come into the design. So this is what we see with Freddy Krueger or Leatherface. So we see this horrible monster whatever that is, straight up front, and it is scary, and we know it's going to be unrelenting from that point on. And also with their powers, you can show early on how powerful they are, and that's what um, Jaws uses as well. So the way the girl gets chomped with the alien, we see the result of it, you know, the power of it when it pops out of its chest and what it's capable of. Um, so if we see something, an early moment where we kind of go, whoa, this is something that's extremely powerful, um, is even more terrifying. So it's like, how the hell are they going to survive against this? And then the next technique is to slowly isolate your protagonist. And the ways you do this is the classic is you kill off those around them. So one by one. So, which is how all the premise of slasher films, Nightmare on Elm Street does that. The Descent with monster film. Um, Jaws is working on that premise. Um, and the other thing is you can set your story in an isolated location. So when they're isolated, so the classic going out to a cabin in the woods, uh, so Evil Dead's a good example of that. They're out there by themselves. So there's a long way to, uh, to get to any help. And also that's usually when communication was cut off now. That's why we endlessly see in horror films, people have to now check their phone and go, oh, we don't have any reception. Because the minute phones came in, it got rid of that. That was that bit about isolation. Um, now you could go, oh, they could call for help. Oh, straight away. 
I actually think cinema will get to a point where we don't even need that scene. The audience is just going to assume, because we've seen it so many times, that we know they're not going to have reception. <laughs> um, and then we're playing around with really base level stuff, which is put them in the dark, creeping around in the dark. Lights go up. There's that whole joke about, you know, with horror films, they go, they didn't have to spend much money on the electricity bill. You know, and this is a little bit with that, they don't make the smartest decisions, but the audience is like, oh my God, don't do that. There's that bit about just flick on some lights in the house. Um, <clears throat> and then once you've done all of these elements, um, then at the climax of the story, so this will happen in the last act, is they must face the monster themselves one-on-one -on -one and be totally vulnerable. So this is how we get that real terror and that real dread and horror and all of them do that. So Alien Ripley's by herself with the uh, alien in the escape pod. Jaws by the end of it is that great kind of climax moment when the boat's been totally destroyed. Brody thinks both of the, you know, um, Quint and Hooper have been killed. He doesn't know Hooper's still alive. But the boat is sinking to the point where it's him up on the crow's nest down, just hanging just off the water with the shark coming towards him. He's just got a rifle. That's it. Um, Nightmare on Elm Street, Nancy has to go into the dream to confront Freddy and try and bring him out. Um, and the slasher film will always usually be the, um, what we call the final girl, which is the character, will be one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's with uh, Jason or Michael Myers or whoever that is. So they need to fight them. Well, usually they win for the most part, but they never fully defeat the horror. So there's a great moment in, in Halloween right at the end when even though they, uh, Michael Myers gets shot, his body's not there. So there's this idea that the horror will keep going. Um, <clears throat> And the final point on, on that, how you're building that tension and horror effect is you don't want to rely on the same type of scare. So you want variation within them. And the example at the moment that's really popular but tedious is jump scares with loud music stings. It's, a, it, it's really popular. I was watching um, last year in the cinema was the, the Weeping Woman. It was part of that Conjuring universe. Um, and there's a couple of good moments in it, but not, not much, not much great stuff. And I think I just started counting jump scares with music stings and I got up to about 15 and it was just, that was the only effect. Really good horror films use one or two jump scares early on to get the audience, you know, given that little shock, but all the way through, you need greater horror than that. So what you want to do is you want to find variations uh, of, of different, different ways to scare the audience and to, to build and the key bit is save the best till last. So that's when you want them at their most vulnerable, most exposed, and that's when it's the scariest situation. <clears throat> anyway, it's a huge area. There's so much more we could probably do a week long course on, on horror. Um, but they're those kind of key main areas to start building a screenplay around that'll make it work. Um, so is there any questions that anyone had on, on any of those points or other horror stuff? I had one, um, if I may. Yeah. Um, I'm curious what you feel about um, the use of red herrings and misdirection in films. And I, I actually happen to believe that the Ouija board in Exorcist is an example of that. I think there's a few in that film. Yeah. Um, but uh, just in general is a device in a screenplay, how you feel about that. Um. It'll, I think it depends a little bit on the genre and how it's used. I don't like when a, a misdirection is, is used really, really cheaply to kind of just distract or get in the way. And TV does this a little bit at the moment and the way they're stretching out series is once they set up this moment of tension, we want to know what's happening, they'll go off into a storyline for two episodes and then come back, which is a slight different one. Um, the Exorcist is an interesting one because also you don't need to exactly explain what the nature of it is. It's just interesting that they have put in there early. Like, is it to do with that? Is it not? Were they playing around with that area? Um, also noises in the attic, which are never explained. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. And also Exorcist has that other bit about the, um, 
there's the statue in the church nearby that's been defaced um, and defiled and they never, they just cut to it. We never hear or explain it. But again, that's part of that horror. We just, but in our mind, I've always assumed that it is, is the devil in the, the devil's doing it or they're in that area. Um, so I think it's, it, misdirectional red herrings work well when it's an early story element to set up, but then gets, mis, gets reinterpreted a different way. Uh, I think particularly crime story usually does that well. And it works really well in crime. We actually, the audience expects misdirection um, and misinterpretation of uh, red herrings. Um, <clears throat> I'm just trying to think of an example of something where I've seen it's cheap that's got nothing to do with the story. Hitchcock used it, his MacGuffin, you know, and it really wasn't about that thing. It wasn't about the instructions or whatever. It was really about the people and and what was happening to them. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that's very much that. That was by the end of, yeah, the more his career went on, the less that became important, but everyone wanted wanted that. Actually, probably an example um, was the, the Clint Eastwood film about the World Cup uh, rugby in South Africa after apartheid. I can't remember the name off the top of my head of the film. Um, there's a character in that who's, he's a pilot and he's scoping out the stadium where the game's going to be, the final's going to be played. And we get this sense that he's scoping it out because he's going to fly his plane in and crash it. And then later we see the game starting and him taking off and heading towards it. And all it is, is he's got this banner written underneath or hanging off the plane celebrating the game. And that was to me, was just a really false and cheap dramatic moment to kind of go, oh, this is a terrorist attack. No, it's a guy just celebrating it. Um, uh, I can't remember the name of the film off the top of my head. Um, but, and Clint Eastman's a great filmmaker usually. It was just a rare scene of his. I was like, I don't know what that's got to do with that, that film. <clears throat> Thank you, you for that info. Mm. Tara, have you got any questions down there? Um, you no, know, I, like, I, I truly have, I, I don't watch a lot of horror, but mostly because I have, uh, it stays with me a little too long. <laughs> um, I'm still afraid of the original Nightmare on Elm Street, and I cannot watch that again. I was terrible <laughs> that. But, um, I, like, there are certain things that I do love about horror that it, it's, it's usually, like, um, like, I love Saw, and I love Scream. Um, I, the dread, the ones that are filled with dread, um, or me trying to figure something out, um, a mystery of some sort. Even, I mean, I love Shaun of the Dead. Like, I love the fun ones, but the ones that really mess with you psychologically wise, they stay with me a little too long. But I'm just curious, like, did you see the TV show Evil? Um, I don't know if it's everywhere, if it was the past, like, it was a couple seasons in the States, and it was so well done because the main person is like someone that's like a skeptic and they do such a great job and the like, casting was really amazing. But do you, do you find like um, when you're trying to, I don't want to say like make something like for TV or for film, do you find that, that there's a genre that fits a little bit, you know, better for like the masses, like the way that I'm, I'm not a true horror fan. Are there certain mm. genres that, you know, that, that you can kind of do that, that, that appeal to more of the masses rather than true horror fans? Are there, are there certain ones that are like, oh, that's not a true horror fan. You don't like slasher or you don't, you know what I mean? Like, are there some, like, cause I, I'd love to write one or try, but I'm just curious if I would do it justice if I only have this. Yeah. It, you know, or, again, it's interesting. With you know, feeling about it. Then. Sorry. What was that last bit? Oh, no, no. I was just, that, I, that was it. That was it. Yeah. It's, I mean, interesting thing with, I'm not convinced horror can work as TV series, only when they're standalone. I've been watching quite a few lately. And I think horror TV that works well is usually it's each episode is a standalone episode. When it builds episode by episode, I think the problem is, is we just have too long a build and breaks in the tension. So you can't ratchet the tension up. So it was something I was watching um, a couple of weeks ago. What was I watching? A few weeks ago. Oh, there's Juwan, so The Grudge, they've made a Netflix series called um, Juwan Origins. 
And I said that the original Juwan is one of the scariest ghost horrors ever made. And I was watching the TV series and it's all actually a bit more like a crime mystery now. Um, and there's just no tension or scare in it because every time you sort of end an episode or you have a break, it dissipates that, especially if it's week by week. Um, Walking Dead, I did really enjoy. Um, that has that okay. great... Gr they built tension really well in that, but they're also working on it. It was quite actiony at times. Um, as for what the I feel like they really focused on the characters. I feel like that's what, I mean, I can watch Walking Dead because of the, the, the world that they've created, that it's just, this is a scary part of the world. And I can kind of like relate to that in what's going on in our real world, not just yeah. pandemic time, but I can relate to, they have all the same issues. It's just not like true horror, but like the first episode, you know, the way that's all introduced, I think that that's really a very well written um, but like the, the show Fringe, that first episode of Fringe, if you haven't seen it, is no. such phenomenal writing um, mm. that it was one of those things that trans, you know, translated like through every genre. Like it was, it was so well done that that's the kind of stuff I I I am drawn to. But I just want to see if you know if there's something that like you don't want to try this because you're gonna have to hit all of these things that people are going to expect because they're all fans of that one. Or oh, okay, just, yeah. Um, yeah, I should say that that shouldn't deter you that they're really into it. It's just that you kind of need to know what what you're doing because when you're doing it, they'll love you for it. Um, it's just that they've seen a lot. So I, I think more on picking where you're going at is with like any writing is knowing what your market is because also the people who like ghost, ghost horrors are not necessarily going to be into really gory slasher films, for example. Um, True. So I would go, for example, I know with... So the surrogate, the film I'm directing, and it's because it's a ghost horror, we're focusing heavily on Southeast Asian market. So we'll be going internationally, but we just know that Southeast Asia or Asian culture in general loves ghost stories. So not only the, the films they love, but it just works. They're very superstitious culture. So that's why we know we're playing. And that's why, I've, I mean, I've watched almost every horror, ghost horror that's come out of there, just to kind of get an idea on what, what they're doing, how they go about it. Um, and we know that that's a bit of a different audience to really, you know, there's the notorious violence slasher type splatter. And that's very much designed to find a very specific audience online. Um, so it's the, the thing is understanding if you do do that notorious one, it has to be really hardcore because the idea is you have to, you got to go, how far can I push this? to get an audience that's seen lots of it to shock them even more. But you wouldn't necessarily do that in a, in a, in a ghost horror yeah. or, or a standard, you know, standard sort of um, slasher or monster film. Um, I feel like I would have to... Yeah, I feel like I would have to avoid some of those. Yeah. I don't think I could do those justice. I feel like... Uh, I want to say story heavy or something merged with something else because I mean it's it's not it wouldn't sometimes played an episode called Hush and it's one of the scariest things because of the way they shot it. It wasn't just like the writing but it was the characters were well done. That the whole thing is um no one can talk so the entire uh show is Yeah. Buffy, yeah. No one can say anything. So when things do pop up you can hear music and so it, it was impressive, but it's just one of those where I, nothing is flat. You know, it would have to be more story, mm. more character. <laughs> yeah, and that's the bit when I was talking at the start about what those subgenres are. With the thing with writing is, is you want to study those subgenres. If you want to write in that one, watch a few, and it'll start to tell you this is what. But that makes sense. Yeah, like so. I don't have to. I don't have to please them all. Is what you're saying. That's helpful. <laughs> no, no. It's the same with like there's different types of, you know, there's six, seven different types of thriller films that you can't be doing. You know, some of them are espionage. Some of them are detective thrillers. Other action thrillers. Like, and you don't have to deliver to week all of the things that happen in them because we're going for a specific type. Um, so it would be more going with, that's the one I'm writing in, what typically is a, um, is a monster horror film doing versus, you know, a monster and a slasher. Halloween uh, is a very different film to Jaws, the way it's gotcha. playing out, or even Nightmare on Elm Street. Um, but that has a bit more crossover. So it's really going, that's the one I'm 
interested in or that's what I want to write in. Now I'm going to understand how that works. Put these principles in. But you write about its production technique as well. And that's the other step with horror. More than any other genre, you've got your script, but it's the way the production is so crucial on the way it's lit, the way it's cast and the way it's shot. Uh, and the what? music as well. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, Cheryl, you're going to say. Yeah, well, just leading on from that, my question was was about the music in horror movies. I mean, you mentioned them in those jump scare scenes, scenes, but you know, if you think about Jaws, I mean, the music for Jaws is just like people. It's just so it's it's okay. so so associated with it. It's just recognisable now for anything that you know. It's it's a classic in itself. So. Okay. Music, I think, can play an, such an important role in these films as well, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And the great bit with that use of music in Jaws is where they stick it in creates that idea of dread, that, you know, something's going to happen and you can't stop it. So, um, yeah, music is, is a massive part of it. And sound design in a horror film. The sound design in, in um, The Exorcist, I was watching that again recently, it's just, it's extraordinary. Everything from her voice... Um, to the different noises in the closet, you know, and up in the ceiling. And, um, sorry, it's breaking up a bit there. Um, yeah, so the music, will, that's what horror, you need all of those elements to work. You know, in a certain films you kind of go, as long as it's lit, you know, comedy just needs to be lit to be seen, you know. Um, but your horror film's got to be lit in a certain way and certain genres you've got to shoot. Um, so all those elements add, but you, again, like anything, it still comes from your, your screenplay, if you create these great, great horror characters and you give those moments, you know, it's like the stuff in Aliens, it's like the design is incredible, but they've still created all the moments on the page. Um, and, but yeah, with um, my composers actually in pre-production start, we've already got about 20 minutes of music for my film composed and it's amazing when you're listening to it to create that atmosphere and actually sense it to the lead actress in the film and she was just texting me going, oh, my God, I'm terrified. I don't even have to act. <laughs> um, we'll do the tricks. So That's right. Yeah. That's that other level on there. Yeah. It plays your mind, doesn't it, the music? Yeah. I have to drop sure. off. I'm sorry to interrupt. I have to yeah. drop off. Thank you all very much. You need to wrap up, too. Thanks for coming along again, Patrick. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. Bye -bye. Great. So if there's any okay. last questions, it's shooting through. Otherwise, I'll uh, catch you with the next one. What, what's the name of your film, David? Uh, it's called The Surrogate. The I'll surrogate. put a, a link in the chat if I can. Uh, yeah, I can send. There's an IMDb. We're about to push some more marketing and stuff shortly. We're just waiting until we can actually start production because we're sure. we're in lockup at the moment. Um, but if you look on Surrogate under my name, there's all the, the, car, the cast is all on board and the crew. We're just waiting. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, okay. Oh, oh. And you'll send us a link to those films. Yes. If we yep. we'll send you an email and uh, yeah. Yep. I'll send a follow up one. I said there's something here. I said we could go on for for out. There's so much to talk on, but I'll send through some stuff that you can follow up on. on with sure. So. Thanks, Dave. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Sorry, Neil. Were you going to say something? What was the name of the um, the women who were uh, in the cave? The descent. Thank you. Yeah, it's really yeah, great. One. Great, great film. Yeah. Great film. Really affect simple. It's just said horror films are simple but effective. You know, that's not a complex story. That that scene when they're going through the really tight crawl space, it's just you kind of go, are they going to get stuck in here? It's perfect horror. David, I have one last question here. Yeah. Um, I heard that with horror films, you don't really have to worry about a big name. You know, if you look back at Alien and and some of the like nightmares and whatever, some of these people went on uh later on but it's really the idea the story the scare that's Absolutely. more important it's, yeah. it's yeah the one genre where you don't need a, a star cast um the right. audience don't go along to see famous people in them but you're right it does a lot of careers have been launched because of horror films right you know so sigourney weaver in alien jamie lee curtis in halloween um uh, we do see those studio type ones when we do get, you know, Jaws or Exorcist or Rosemary's Baby right. when they've got famous people going in. But that's what's great about the, the audi horror audience don't care who's in the film. <laughs> yeah, and those usually are based on books too that already have a, an audience, it seems like, with Jaws and The mm. Exorcist. So that's why they tend to be bigger and, you know, something that Hitchcock did that he would buy the books and then, you know, he's got a built-in audience. So 
Yeah. Wow. And Hitchcock, he, was in, he, never, he always worked with stars. So in his horror films that he did, they were, they, yeah, they're mostly yeah. stars based on books. But, yeah, the audience don't. If, if there's a horror, you know, someone who's been in some horrors that's in it, that will draw some of the audience. But it's not like, say, comedies or rom-coms where people are pretty much yeah. paying to see the cast. Um, right. Which is why it's a good affordable budget, uh, budget range to work in. Yeah. Okay, well, Excellent. thank you very much. I have to run. Thank you very much yeah. for that. I'll uh, send some follow-up. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank Bye. You. All right.